don't know if we are. Oh, yes, okay, there we go. All right, I'll just edit that out. All right, so, interestingly, now I found this super duper interesting. All parental involvement measures, everything that they looked at in the study was equated to some increase in student achievement, except for checking homework. That one, checking homework, had no significant correlation between parental checking of homework and increased student achievement. Hmm. So again, that's telling me that I can approach a parent and say, you don't need to check that homework. You don't need, you leave the math teaching to me. I can take care of that. You need to talk to your child about your expectations for them. That's your job. Mm -hmm. And so that, I feel a bit empowered by this because that's something I can take to a parent, right? So I thought that was super interesting because people, oh, well, did you have your parents check your homework? They don't need to. Mm -hmm. All right, so Judd's and Steam Academy. Now, this is from the research I did at the end of the year. We've talked about it a couple times. I'm reiterating it for the purposes of um, this presentation. That, come on now. All right, so I did a survey. I only had 34 teachers respond, which was annoying. But um, <laughs> I, I had asked them, you know, what they thought affects the culture at JSA, either positively or negatively, because I've heard a lot of, I've heard a lot of, right? We don't like that kind of thing. We prefer data. But I have heard anecdotally a lot of teachers saying, well, the parents just aren't involved. So when I asked that question, 80% of the 34 teachers who answered said parental involvement or lack thereof. So that's interesting. However, of the 194 students that I surveyed, and these are all 6th and 7th graders, right? So we still have them in the school. 40% responded that their parents would ground them if they didn't do well in school. And 53% responded that their parents place importance on school. So there's a disconnect there that we're not addressing because we've got teachers who say, oh, well, they don't care. I've heard teachers say their parents don't care. They just don't care. And I think what's happening is they're focusing on the minority instead of the majority. And that's absolutely true. So we've got to fix our mindset there. But also it made me wonder if maybe there's something else we could do in the sense of, you know, okay, well, parental expectations, that's important. A lot of parents don't know how to talk to their kids about that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that. So, well, this is our this is our responses to that. I don't know why I have an extra slide there. Okay, this is what I thought was interesting. Now, this is from Learning Heroes. It's a nonprofit that looks into um, student achievement and how to increase it. Um, and I just copied the quote because it was so profound. In increasingly polarized America, a new poll shows the parents of K through eight public school students, irrespective of race, ethnicity, income level, and educational attainment, share high expectations for their children. Chief among these is that 75% of all parents and even higher proportions of African American, 83%, and Hispanic, 90% of parents believe that attaining a two or four year college degree is very important for their child. So you're telling me, teachers, that none of these parents care, but we have a study saying that's just not true, especially with our population, 83%, 90%. No, this is not the case. So either we're not communicating with them correctly, or they don't know how to communicate with their own children about expectations. So, um, now, what was also interesting, though, from this study is the fact that they found that more than four in five parents say their children are on track in school. Now, we know that's not the case, right? And 90% of parents believe their children are achieving at or above grade levels in math, and the same percentage believe that, re uh, that about reading, despite national statistics and Judson Steen Academy statistics to the contrary. So... That's a communication issue, right? right? So we need to be on the phone with those parents saying, hey, your kiddo, this is where they're functioning. This is where they need to be. We need to find a way to talk to them about talking to their kids. Well, and I think, you know, being a parent, you know, um, you know, you have so many things on your plate, right? right. Things that you have to pay attention to. Um, I think uh, parents do have high expectations. But do they speak them right. to their kids, right? And I think, you know, the other thing of, of the disconnect between believing that their students are on track uh, and whether their students are on track or having those checks, right? Um, like at the end of the six weeks, are we having a check with the parent and student to say, okay, your student is at a 65 or a 70, you know, two. Is that your expectation for right. your child? And those parents... You know, communicating to their child that is not my expectation. You know, my expectation is for you to have an A or a B, 
I think, registers with that kid. That Absolutely, because it's more when it comes from a parent, right? Because right. then they know that they t- that we've talked to them. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, your teacher says that you should be functioning at a 73, but you're at a 65, you mm-hmm. know? And it doesn't have to be that, and we need to help the parents understand that we're not looking for perfection from every kid. We just want progress, and that's a five-point improvement for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, again, that's the idea of we need to teach the parents how to talk to the kids. Mm-hmm. And that's going to go with, well, come on now. There we go. All right, so how can this dynamic be changed? How can we team with our parents to create a partnership of achievement? That's what my focus is going to be this year. Actionable items. So you go to the war with the army you have, not the army you might want or wish to have at a later time. So we can sit here and say, well, you know, it would be great if we had 70% non-ECD like they do in some of the school districts I look at, but that's not us. That's not the army we have. The army we have is 70% ECD. So we've got to work with what we have. So we started talking about this. Now this, I took all of these, I took pictures from the training the other day from the sticky notes that were up there. I was like, ooh, I'm gonna take this for my presentation. Um, So parental involvement, if that's our silver silver bullet, what is that gonna be? We're doing a lot of it. Blue Devil recognition, calls home, emails, parent surveys, IV showcase, that was a smashing success. Um, Call out, social media. We've talked about all those, those are all great. And we'll keep doing that. now. What I found interesting in some of the research that I had done is that it's not just about parent involvement, it's about specific parent involvement. Because what they found is that wealthier parents engage in the school in different ways than parents in poverty will. So, a 2016 study of 14,000 parents suggests that parents in poverty engage in different ways than more affluent parents. What they found is that parents in poverty were 20 percentage points or more less likely to do things like fundraising, volunteering, school committee, attending class events, field trips, blah, blah, blah. What they did find is that a higher percentage of children in poverty always had an adult check that their homework was completed. But we just found out that that's not effective. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's not interesting, that connection there. It is. And so that's what the research is saying, that that's not effective. Mm-hmm. It doesn't do any good. Mm-hmm. So what do we need to do? We need to, again, educate the parents into how they can actively engage. Oh my goodness, this thing hit. Okay, so focus on helping the parents, right? That's the, that's what I feel like needs to be the goal here. Um, one dream, two realities, yet another study, I read 8,000 of them. Um, schools should avoid waiting until there is a disciplinary problem to contact parents. Now I know, you know, when I taught at my previous school, we only had 20 kids. I had the time to call them up and be like, every time Johnny did something perfect, oh, hey, mom, Johnny did this great. Um, and there are other names to use. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Bobby, sorry, not singling out anybody. <laughs> Bobby, sorry, that was, my dad's name was John, so I just went with that. But, um, <laughs> So, uh, but you want to do it early enough in the process so that the first call they receive is not the one telling them that their kid is in trouble. I had a student two years ago, came to me from Johnston McQueen, um, handed me his behavioral packet. I said, oh dear, this is going to be fun. I said, no, baby, put that away. We're going to take care of this ourselves. Um, And so I watched him for a day and I started working with him and I made him a deal. I said, okay, every time you do something good, raise your hand, don't blurt out, answer a question, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to give you a tick mark. And every time you get a tick mark, that's worth one point. If you get five points by the end of the day, you get a piece of candy. He ate it up. And within three weeks, he was not an issue in my class. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember I called his mom because I was like, okay, I gotta get mom on board with this too. Mm -hmm. I called mom and he had done something. It was something little. I don't even remember. He was very good at math, right? Um, And so I called his mom and I said, you know, he's really talented in math. And when she had answered the phone, her first response was, oh no, what now? Because she had never, and she told me that she had never gotten a positive school Mm -hmm. call. Mm -hmm. And for that child, now he may have just been an exception, but by the end of the year, and he came to me in December, by the end of the year, he had shot up 30 points in reading and he got mastery in math. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that to me is the biggest indicator of those parental relationships and the communication, because once you get them on your side, that's going to be your biggest asset, you know, your, your biggest asset, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, and I was talking about this with Ms. Pondit, our thinking about this is really dovetailed together. Uh, within the first week, three weeks of school, contact every parent with a positive comment. For 90 students, this would be six student contacts per day, four days a week, right? That's not a whole lot. And she had actually said, no, it's gonna be within the first or two, one or two weeks, because she didn't think of the same thing. It's actually, as part of our Title I, it's going to be a mandatory thing. So it worked out well. Um, so like I said, this has been extremely effective for me personally, um, especially during the pandemic. I ended up having a lot of parents um, texting me just on my personal phone i know we're not supposed to do that but um, it worked for us during the pandemic right um and a lot of those same kids i had this year 
and because I had those same kids, not surprisingly at all, because if they were going to start acting, I'm going to text your mom right now. Oh, no, don't, don't do that, Miss Thomas. And I had one kiddo who I worked really hard building a relationship with. She's never passed a math star. She passed this year. And so I really feel that's because, um, you know, I was taking the time to build that relationship with mom, checking in with mom and all that. Um, and then this is something that's really been evident to me lately, the idea of um, unconscious bias. Uh, my mother was a school teacher for 26 years. She taught a lot of high power. I mean, she taught in like Miami Beach. Just get slept on tents, came to school, you know, on the sleeping on the beach with beach sores and you know, things like that. She taught in high poverty, and yet she still will make comments that make me think she's just not clued in about what's going on. Um, you know, I mentioned you know we have high ECD and it's hard you know with the basics with the math because a lot of times the kids miss it. Well, and what she said was, well, just the parents just need to count Cheerios with them. Well, mom, I know to count Cheerios with my now 13 year old, but a lot of these parents don't know to do that. They weren't raised in a house where it wasn't a question of if I went to college, it was where, right? Um, and so we need to keep in mind that those parents haven't had possibly, especially the lower achieving parents, that have had positive experiences with school. This may be the first, first positive influence or positive communication or positive anything that a parent has had in school is with you. And we need to let go of our uncon uh, you know, unconscious biases. So I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Also, um, another study. <laughs> One study of 71 high poverty schools found that when the teachers were active in outreach to families, students reading and math scores improved at a 50% faster rate in reading and a 40% faster rate in math. What worked? Meeting every family face to face, sending materials home for parents to use to help their kids, and staying in regular touch with families on kids' progress. Mm -hmm. Now we do our six week things where we're supposed to do our parent contact log. I'm not sure that it's been as effective as we want it to be. Um, because to me, what this says is every six weeks I've been in contact with Bobby's mom saying, hey, here's how Bobby did on the common assessment. Now I know that you feel we can do better with this. How can we do that? How can I help you help him? Having that kind of a relationship, because that's what's going to make the difference here. That's the 50% faster improvement in reading, 40% faster improvement in math. That's what that is. It's not just a, your kid sniffed at me today. Okay, bye, have a good day, you know? So. <laughs> and it says, too, meeting every parent, every family face to face. I, I was, yeah. Not email. Not, on the phone. not email. <laughs> and, and that's been hard with the pandemic. And I have, I, I'm. I'm feeling optimistic because I've been bugging Miss Pondit about letting me do home business. <laughs> and she said she'll, she, I, I think I've worn her down. She said she's going to ask Miss Bowie if that's okay. And she said, you know, she's not against it if teachers are okay with it. I served a mission for a church in Boise, Idaho, in the dark parts of Boise, Idaho. I, it, nothing like this scares me. Um, and so I don't well, have a problem with that. You know, now everybody's comfortable with Google Meet and Zoom. Right? Yeah. And I think, you, you know, just having that face to face conversation. Um, then you could hit a lot more of your parents, right? Because you're not trans, you know, you're not, you're driving They're not all over the place. They're not having to come up to the school. Right. They're, They're not having that, having that yeah. face, you know, that rich For you know, sure. face to face. Uh, For image. sure. And and that's only going to benefit those kids. Now, is it going to work with 100% of the parents? No. Some of them are going to straight up ignore you. We can't do anything about that, right? Outside of our sphere of influence. And some parents may not have the means. They may not have the technology. Or whatever. Right. They may not. And so it's that way, it may be helpful to be, hey, can I come over? You know, just at 7 o'clock, I just want to bring you some cookies and say hi. You know, just to have that kind of working relationship, I think is what makes that difference. Yeah. Because then because also, you're a team. I mean, exactly. You're a team, and you need to include them. One time uh, when I first moved, I taught fifth grade at an elementary here in town. And when I moved, and I did home visits all the time. And then when I moved over here, I was teaching a seventh grade ELA. And I didn't think anything of it. I started going to these people's houses. Oh, you won't come, Miss Beery. You won't come. And when I, knock, 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 knock. And that made the difference in the world with that parent and with that student because mm -hmm. then you're a team like i said with that one mm -hmm. that one little girl i had this year who's never passed if all i had to do was threaten i'm gonna let your mom know what you just said oh no and if i ever had to go through with it okay i'll take care of it and she meant it and it made a huge difference mm -hmm. um so that staying in regular touch i think so like I said, I think our six weeks log needs to be more than just texted so and so about their missing. And I think for our older students, seventh and eighth grade students that participate in athletics, mm -hmm. band, going to those to let them know to I support you and also trying to yes. ha just have a conversation with their parents. Oh, yeah, and that, that would be a great way to do it. Those, like, um, like 
like, of course, I was obviously there for Johnny and, <laughs> and Jacob. But then, like, I'd see other kids that attend here, and they, you know, they find find up like I was there for them. them you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 But it makes you know. Difference. Yeah, so the next day, if you got to get on to somebody in the cafeteria, you know, they're like, oh, okay, Miss Beth. Because, yeah. you know, I've been, they think I've been there right. for them, you know, yeah. like, well, I'm curious, you know, if teachers don't do it because they're just told they have to, yeah. as opposed to when you see the research, say, if you want the number one thing you can do to help your kid, your students improve, here's the research, yeah. right? It's contacting those parents. Right? That's Having why that I'm big on the research, yeah. because I'm like, hey, if I show it to you, hopefully you're going to make that decision yeah. to make that for yourself rather than right. the right. Right. Yeah. That's good. For sure. Um, and I, you know, I know we're all busy and things like that. I mean, I've got a child at home on a ventilator. I can't always make it to the games, but, but like, heck, I'm going to be there for that kiddo next year. If, every time I can be, I'm going to be there for him because I want him to see I'm still there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I always, like, this is kind of like my guiding philosophy with teaching um, because some days you just get so frustrated and there's so much. There are race factors. There are poverty factors. There's this factors, that factors. There's so much. Um, and it's not gonna, there's no panacea for it. We're not gonna be able to fix everybody, right? Um, but I always come back to the starfish story, you yeah. know, where you know, you got the old man walking on the beach, sees the little boy throwing the starfish back in the water. Well, you can't possibly make a difference here. You got 89 kids who you're trying to get up in, in math. You can't get all of them. No, I can't. But that one little girl who's never passed a, a star test before, I made a difference to her. That one little boy who we've been talking about, who we got into algebra, who needs to be in algebra, made a difference to him. And so that's, that's what I think the biggest thing is, and it's not about time. I mean, if you've got it, take it. If you can't do it, then find other ways to do 